the grandeur of the mountains and all of the different uh, topography here on planet Earth and then the stars and everything in the heavens. We, we praise the Lord, don't we, as Christians? We give glory to him. It, it gives us a little glimpse into the majesty of our God. And so I, I just, uh, somebody in the congregation mentioned that song and I thought it was a wonderful song illustrating that and causing us to praise the Lord. Well, boys and girls, you're dismissed uh, to Children's Church. And while they're being dismissed, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you again uh, someone who most of you know. Uh, Dave Rogers is an elder here at Grace Bible Church. He's a former pastor. He's someone who loves the Word of God and loves to share it with others. And uh, so at this time, Brother Dave's going to come up and share with us the Word of God. Let me mention this too. Chris, if you could be in the back afterwards, that might be better. Out in the vestibule, people can greet you and ask you any questions they might have. Dave? Hey, great. Thanks, Dean. Great. Chris, you're a joy to me. You're a joy to me, brother, to see you just go out on your own and serve Christ. You're a joy to me. It's great. Yeah. Great. Please take your Bibles this morning, folks, and I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Had it there. I got to find it again. There we go. The passage of Scripture I'd like to read for you this morning is simply verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Lord God, as we come now to your word, may you be glorified in its truth. May our hearts be open and our minds be simulated to agree with and to embrace that which we find in scriptures. For the truth of the scriptures liberates us and gives us joy. And may that be the case this morning as we hear your truth in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now the passage that we're looking at, to you, at, at this morning is familiar to most of you. Most of you have heard many messages on this passage because there's great truth in it. But it's within a larger context of offering ourselves to the Lord, which is a holy act of worship, which is truly pleasing to God. God covets our worship and God enjoys us worshiping him. Paul encourages us in this passage of scripture to live transformed lives by not conforming to the pattern of this world, but by being transformed by the renewing of our minds. The transformed life is the life of a true believer. Let me say that again. The transformed life is the life of a true believer. God expects no other kind of life for those who have been saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when I first heard, read these words by Donald Gray Barnhouse, I was kind of taken back. I guess because of my own struggles in my own Christian life and trying to live for the Lord consistently day by day. But when I gave these words some thought, I realized that God took, could expect no other life, no other life in those in whom he has given the new birth through the Holy Spirit. Now this purpose of, for our lives was initially expressed by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where he writes, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Israel. His son. That's God's purpose for our life to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. The beloved John tells us that one day in the future, we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we see two commands and a joyful promise. So let's by begin by looking at the two commands here. The first is kind of negative. He says, 
do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Now this is a fairly easy command to understand, is it not? Paul is telling us we are not to allow ourselves to be molded, to be shaped into the world's scheme of things. We are not to live and act in, in step with the ideals and methods and goals of those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. We are not to follow the whole manner of life of this society and civilization. This is fairly easy for us to understand, is it not? Yes. In practical terms, this means that we are not to live as if God is out of the picture. Now, if you watched like I did, part of the Women's March on Washington, D.C. and the other cities around the country last week, you witnessed this very philosophy of life in action. The crude signs, the open nudity, the vulgar language, the hate speech, the me first and me only attitude reflected in everything about, is about being conformed to this world. Everything that you saw was about being conformed to this world. And this is nothing new at all. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, as for you, Christians, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you, listen, followed the ways of this world. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Then down a little further, Paul writes in verse 12, remember that at time that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, and notice what he says, without hope and without God in the world. Without hope and without God in the world. If you're conforming to the world's scheme of things, if you're being molded into the world's way of thinking, you are literally without hope and without God in this world. And Paul says to the Christians, this is not for us. And then in Titus chapter three, verse three, Paul says at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That is being conformed to the scheme of things and to the pattern of this world. Now on the other hand, there was a march for life this past Friday. What a contrast to philosophy and ideals. These people marched for others, not for themselves. They spoke for those who could not speak. The speeches were filled with love and hope. There was a determination to honor God and preserve the sacredness of life for all humans, born and unborn. And when the march was over, they left the mall clean, not littered with the trash and filth left by the woman's protest. What a contrast, what a difference. And so Paul is saying, we who are saved by Christ, we who give ourselves to Christ as a living sacrifice are not to be conformed and molded into the world's scheme of things. That is pretty easy to understand, but sometimes not so easy to accomplish in our lives. And so Paul says the second command is to be transformed, what? By the renewing of your mind. Now this command is a little more complicated to understand. It takes some honest, straight thinking to, um, to really get into what Paul is meaning here. The transformed life comes by, what well, Paul says, the renewing of the mind. This word renew or renewal is found here and only in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Look back at verse 3 again. If, you're, if you have your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 3, verse 3, and look 
quickly at what Paul says here. And I'll read it again, Titus 3. At one time we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That was us before Christ, and it's not a pretty picture. But then in verse 4 and 5 and following, we read this. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. <clears throat> he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, oh, what does Paul mean in these verses? Well, let's kind of... Uh, look at it a little more closely, shall we? And I want to take you back to creation. When God created Adam, he did so by breathing into him the breath of life. And the scriptures tell us man became a living soul when God breathed into him. And at that point, Adam had a body, he had a soul and a spirit. And his spirit was alive unto God. And that is why he fellowshiped with God in the garden. That is why when he heard God walking in the garden, Adam was joyfully anticipating that time that he had to speak with God, to fellowship with God, and to worship God. Now how that looked, I don't know, but I'm sure Adam thoroughly enjoyed it, and I know God thoroughly enjoyed it as well. But after the fall, something happened. After the fall, the Spirit of God left him. And his spirit, his human spirit, died. And though physically alive, Adam was now spiritually dead. And so when you look back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 3, I mean, it is not surprising to read when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. And thus, from the fall, every human being born into this world is born in the image of Adam. He is born, what I mean by that, is that he is born with a frail physical body and an inner nature which is depraved and fallen. He is spiritually dead. We are all born in the image of Adam. That is, we are born with a frail physical body and we are born with a spirit. Uh, a depraved and fallen nature. We are spiritually dead. Now, this is not to deny the fact that we were created and we are still created in the image of God. But what God is telling us in Genesis chapter 3, 5 is, is his way of telling us that the image has been marred by sin. And now we look more like Adam than we look like God. And so man is born into this world in a condition I liken to a three-story building which, is, which has been bombed, which has had a bomb dropped on it. Now, I hope you're still following me here. If you can, picture with me the bombed out buildings in London during World War II and how the city of London must have looked. For example, the third story has, been, has collapsed down into the second story of the building. The building now is a two-story building with the third story destroyed. The third story of the building is still there, but it is all mangled and mixed up and lying on the floor of the second story. The three-story building is now a two-story building. The third story is destroyed. It's mangled. It's all part of the second story of the building now. And the condition of man, natural man, is just like that. He has a body and a soul spirit. He has a body and human spirit. That is why in theology we have this debate being, being a dichotomous or a trichotomous. Man in his unsaved state is a di dichotomy. There's just a two thing. His, 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 that spirit is being mangled into his, his other spirit, his soul. There is a co-mingling of the soul and spirit of man. It's all mixed up. And this is why man does not receive the things of the Holy Spirit. He is soulish and religious, but he's not alive unto God. That's why you have all these. That's why we're religious. 
but we're still spiritually dead. And this is why no one seeks for God. This is why there is a wholesale rejection of the truth of God and a love for anything that is idolatrous. And this is why man exalts human reason and human wisdom above God's wisdom. This is why man embraces evil, calling it good, and rejecting good and calling it evil. This is the mind of the natural man. For example, how many of you have ever purchased a Bible and given it to an unsaved person to read? I suppose many of us here have done that, including myself. But what usually happens to that Bible? Well, they thank you, you leave, they take that Bible, they look at it, and they put it on a shelf, never to look at it again. You call up, oh, I'd like to come and visit. They run to the shelf, they take the Bible down, they dust it off and put it on the coffee table for you to see. It's as beautiful and as new as the day that you gave it. There's no dog-eared pages or nothing. You walk in the house, you visit, you look at the Bible, you know, you understand. And then when you leave, what happens? The Bible is taken and put right back on the shelf. Oh, they respect it. They, it's the Bible. They respect it. But there's no desire to read it. Why? Because their minds are not renewed. They are spiritually dead. But what happens at the time of our rebirth in Jesus Christ is that we are made alive by the Spirit of God who comes into our bodies. We are made alive unto God. And we are a new creation. Now don't miss that. We are a new creation. We become body and soul and spirit again. The human spirit is made alive unto God by the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. And that's a wonderful thing. God tells us that this coming end of the Holy Spirit is to be the means of the transformation of our lives. We are no longer to live a soulish life, but we are to live a life in the Spirit. We are to be dominated by the presence of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ living within our being. Now, this is reflected in verses like Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where Paul writes, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, we read, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be an offering, a sin offering. So that he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. As how we can live now according to. To the Spirit. Now, it is not the case, some have mistakenly made the case that the Spirit is living for us. No, it is not the case of the Holy Spirit living for us, but there is now a human and divine cooperation that was not there before because we have been made alive and we are now new creation in Christ. Now, here is the point that I want you to understand. Here is the point that I want you to get. The renewal of our minds, the renewal of our minds, which leads to a transformed life, is part of our spirit. When our spirit is made alive in Jesus Christ by the incoming of the Holy Spirit, we begin to think straight again. We begin to think sanely, soberly. Listen again to what, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 12. This is amazing, what, what Paul says. He says, however, as it is written, now he's talking about the context of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says here, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The gospel, 
The Spirit searches all things. Now he's giving an example of what he means. Searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows the person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may, what? Understand what God has freely given us. What is Paul saying here? He is saying that no philosopher, the brightest minds apart from Jesus Christ, could never come up with the gospel. It is so foreign to the natural man that God would send his Son, that God would love us, that God would seek to save us, that Jesus Christ would live a perfect life, that he would die on the cross for our sins, that he would rise from the dead as a, as a demonstration to the world that God the Father had accepted his sinless sacrifice for sins, and that all who would simply repent and put their trust in him would have eternal life. No mind, no human mind could ever come up with that plan to save man and rescue man from his misery on this earth. And we see that. The message of the gospel, the church of Jesus Christ, is the only answer for this world. All other religions, all other philosophies, all other ideas fall far short, could never come up with that plan because their minds are not renewed and they are conformed to the world's system and scheme of things. And that's what Paul is telling us here. Now the picture is coming clear. At least it is to me. I studied it. Now I'm preaching it. I hope it's becoming clear to you as well. In the fall, we lost true understanding. We did. There is no better illustration of this than Paul's encounter with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens, Greece. This encounter is recorded in Acts chapter 17. You remember when Paul arrives in the city of Athens, he is confronted with a city full of idols, full of idols. This greatly distressed Paul. He enters the local synagogue, as was his custom, Luke tells us, and he reasoned with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks concerning Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And there, from there, he goes to the marketplace and he's preaching the gospel into the marketplace. And there, some uh, Epicureans and Stoic philosophers hear him preaching. And they invite him to the Arab say that Aeropagus something like Aeropagus which is real it's it's simply an outcropping of rocks in Athens that forms a natural amphitheater and they would go there and speak and listen to one another talk about philosophies and so they invite Paul to this place to hear his new teaching their initial response is recorded by Luke and listen to what Luke says what is this babbler trying to say that was their initial response to Paul what is this babbler trying to say? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know. and others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. No, he wasn't. He was advocating God and Jesus. They also asked Paul, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. All right. So but Paul goes on. Paul continues, he goes on to establish the fact that Jehovah God was the unknown God they sought not to offend. And he tells him he was the creator and sustainer of all things, and he was the savior of mankind through Jesus Christ by raising his son from the dead. And then Luke, then Luke records their reaction to that news. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, Luke writes, some of them sneered. That's natural man's initial reaction to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They sneer. This is natural man's pattern of thinking without life, but without the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. This was what you and I were like before we came to Christ. But in the moment of our new birth, in the moment of our new birth, we, are, we gain true understanding by the renewal of our minds. 
The coming of new life, which is the life of Christ, makes it possible for us to have a whole life transformed. And that is because we now begin to think straight. We begin to think sanely. Our minds are renewed, and our minds are being renewed as we read God's holy word. That is why I always harp upon, emphasize the personal reading of the holy word of God in your personal lives. There's no better way to grow in Christ than getting alone and opening the scriptures and simply reading it. Reading it. And God the Holy Spirit will illumine your mind as you read it and will guide you into all truth. And that is why I harp on meeting and listening to good messages. That is why we are blessed here at Grace Bible Church to have a pastor who exposits the Word of God, who honors the inspiration of scriptures, who is true to the Word of God in his personal life and in his proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a blessed congregation to have Pastor Dean, and I mean that with all of my heart. Amen? Amen. 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 Now when God, now when we read, now because we, our minds have been renewed, now when we read that God created the world, we embrace it as truth. When we read about the fall of man and how it has poisoned our own souls, we sigh in agreement. We readily repent daily and surrender ourselves to Jesus, for we see the wisdom in it. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical reality that gives us hope. Walking the straight and narrow is much more appealing than running with a crowd down the broad road that leads to hell. And why is all that different now? Because our minds have been renewed by the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. But Paul doesn't stop there. Not just commands us, but now he gives us a joyful promise. Notice what he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And that, I got to get back there. Give me just a second. He says, Then you will be able to test and approve that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. That's a precious and joyful promise. Offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice is something God considers holy and pleasing to him. When we yield to him in love and confess our own bankruptcy and his perfection, we will receive all good things from him. In fact, he shows us his will for our lives. And when he does, we find that his work in our lives is good, it's pleasing, it's perfect. Like you, finding, learning his will and seeking to do it is the joy of my life. Nothing gives me greater joy than to, to surrender my life to the will of God and to have him work in and through me. I have experienced many setbacks in my life, most of my own doing, like you. But amazingly, they have all been part and parcel of God's perfect plan for me and for you. And I have learned that his will is good and well-pleasing and perfect in all things related to me and my family. But this cannot be said for those who are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. This promise of God's perfect and well-pleasing will is not universal. If one chooses to live out his own natural will according to the bent of his old nature, the life will be frustrating and his end or their end will be bitter. Rather than resting in the goodness of God in Christ, vain striving will be the experience of those seeking to please their own will. And that is a sad but true reality of most people in this world. Now let me bring all of this together. Let me summarize all that I've been saying in a few words here. The transformed life is the normal Christian life. It's what God expects of you as a result of being born again by the Holy Spirit. God expects no other way of life for the believer in Christ. Once the believer is born into the family of God by the Holy Spirit, 
His spirit is made alive and his mind is renewed and being renewed. Now he delights in the wisdom of God found in the scriptures. He hungers and thirsts for God and feeds upon the word of God all the while renewing his mind and renewing his soul. Something begins to happen in our lives. Life changes. He is transformed. We are transformed and being transformed. Spiritual tensions do arise and the battles do begin in our souls. But the victories are won. Ungodly friends are cast off. Godly friends friends are embraced. And the will of God gradually comes into focus. And our souls find that it's good, that it's pleasing, and that it's perfect for our lives. And we wonder, why did it take us so long to catch on? Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and for the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. I pray, O oh God, I ask you that you would work in, your, in, in the souls of those who are sitting here today. Only you can open a soul. Only you can renew the mind, God. Only you can cause a person to be.